Welcome to the Masculine Psychology Podcast, where we answer key questions in dating, relationships, success, and fulfillment, and explore the psychology of masculinity. Now, here's your host, world-renowned therapist and life coach, David Tien. Welcome to the Masculine Psychology Podcast. I'm David Tien, your host, and I'm excited to get you into episode four. In this episode, we're going to be getting into why values are so important in your dating and relationships, why moral values and your moral principles and what you stand for, your ideals, are so important. They are a necessary and key element in success in your love life. So I've got three points here to walk you through. But before we do that, I want to set the bigger context here. And the bigger context is that most people in this world have bought into this myth that happiness is natural, that it's as if we were evolved to be happy. And that's just not true. This is important because when it comes to your love life, a lot of people think it should just happen naturally, that we are evolved to just have happiness in our personal lives. And that's not true because, in fact, we've only been evolved for survival and reproduction. And a lot of getting ahead in life means hard work and sacrifice and cutthroat uh, society or cutthroat competition. And that actually often precludes happiness and it especially precludes love. And if what you're after is actually love and unconditional love and happiness and fulfillment and joy in a relationship of intimacy, of acceptance of your vulnerability, of connection, then that's something that you're going to have to take active steps to create in your life. And the myth is that, that all of that should just happen naturally. And there's a frustration around it not happening naturally. And one of the reasons why it doesn't happen naturally for a lot of people is because they haven't stopped to think about what their values are, what their actual moral values are, what their ethics are, what they think of goodness or the moral good, and what that would actually mean in their lives, and whether they are trying to live up to some standard that they have decided for themselves of what goodness would be, or whether they even care whether there is such a thing as goodness, let alone what it is, and whether they believe that such a thing exists. Most people walk around this planet not having thought about any of those questions in any meaningful way. And that's one of the main reasons why they are not able to find happiness or love in their relationships and why they get frustrated in their dating lives when they want something more than just physicality. They want intimacy. And their lack of clarity around their values blocks their ability and potential to find happiness and love. So these three points that we're about to dive into are super important. They're essential. They're necessary. We are not evolved for happiness and love. We are adapted for survival and reproduction. Those are two different things. And if what you're after is happiness and love, you've got to create that. Okay, so let's dive into the first point. The first point is answering the very basic and natural question of, especially for men, why is it that so many of us men don't realize this? <laughs> why is it that so many of us don't think in terms of happiness and love and are instead focused on the surface level goals or the superficial goals of just getting girls. And on the surface of it, it's just obvious. Like we went through puberty when we were younger and there we were focused on just sex and hot girls and body parts and physical gratification. And then as we get older, some of us stayed immature and continued to look for those or because we never got those fulfilled we might have this still this curiosity that an adolescent teenager would have about them, and that gets carried forward. Okay, so that's an obvious one, but I'm not generally focusing on men who are just teenagers or have a teenage state of mind. So there's something actually deeper than, than that when it comes to men in their 30s and 40s who are still stuck on not being able to focus on the happiness and love that they're really after. And they think that they all they really want is money, power, women, or these, you know, these superficial goals. Where is that coming from? So one of the theses I'm proposing here, one of the underlying 
assumptions so far that I've been inferring is that what guys are actually really after isn't just physical gratification or sexual gratification. It's actually something deeper. And that could be connection, love, unconditional love, acceptance, as kind of security to feel worthy or significant or enough. And you can use the big uh, catch-all term of happiness or a more academic term of subjective well-being or whatever it is. A feel, these are feelings. These are emotions. And that's what men are really after. They're really after these emotions, not the actual sexual gratification. Though, of course, if you're really immature, that might be the case, like if you're a teenager. So why is it that most guys aren't aware of this? Because it seems like most guys are just focused on the outward uh, goals of just getting women for sexual gratification. And even the guys for whom love and connection is their primary motive or motivation, even for them, they're not even aware of that. And that's one of the big reasons why, and something we explored in the first episode, why so many millions of people are Google searching, YouTube searching for tips. And these are tips with headlines that are couched in such a way as to be focused on just the superficial goals, how to get women to chase you, how to control women, how to control your dating life, uh, how to get girls attracted to you. And I propose from my own experience that there are a lot of men for whom that's not their main motivation. They're hoping that if they get that, if they get the physical, you know, the sex, if they get her attracted to him or enough women attracted to him, that then, therefore, that will lead to him being happy or feeling enough. And he's also hoping in the back of his mind that that would lead to the thing he really wants, which is love in an unconditional love. So that's the thesis. I'm going to be showing why that's the case. I'm going to be arguing for that over the course of many episodes. But I just want to put that out there. And then as point number one, why is it that so many men are blind to their own motivations? Okay, so working hypothesis, that's actually what's happening. If it's not happening for you, I totally understand. And, and that's a very real possibility. I'm not saying that all men who are Googling uh, dating tips are actually focused or actually really driven by their need for love or other needs or their emotional needs. Some of them might just need to get off. <laughs> And they're, instead of looking at porn, they go look for tips. Okay, get that. There's a minority, I think, of men, especially as I, you move into the 30s and 40s, who are like that. But I'm, this podcast is not for them. If, so if that's you, you should probably just go, you know, go get some porn or dating tips or whatever. You're probably not listening to this. So for most of my clientele, well, all of my clientele, most of my audience, there's something deeper. And the first point is about why there's this blind spot. And one of the most obvious ones, I guess it's one of the most easy to examine one, uh, factors is toxic masculinity. Okay, so I'm not going to do a whole episode on toxic masculinity, though I could easily do that. Because generally, my audience isn't too concerned about toxic masculinity, because they're quite aware that they are not exhibiting toxic masculinity. So that's a problem for somebody else. <laughs> However, even if you think you're free from toxic masculinity, you should be aware that there's a toxicity in many types of masculinity in the culture that you're embedded in. Okay, so this can be in the form of machoism or some kind of repression. And here's an easy example. Do you believe, consciously or unconsciously, that success will lead to happiness? This belief, this false belief, and this limiting belief that if you were just successful enough, then finally you will be happy, which cash that out really for guys, which means happy in the sense of you'll feel like you're enough, you'll feel like you're worthy of love, and hopefully you will actually feel unconditional love through achieving success in whatever area. And this drives achievers really hard. And the most hard driving achievers, the ones who work seven days a week for five to 10 years and work from 8 a.m. to 12 midnight, you know, nonstop, seven days a week for five to 10 years. I have clients who've done that and are driven by this underlying belief, this background belief, this assumption that they think everyone buys into. They just think this is how the world is because it was something that they 
discovered for themselves early on in their lives when they were a year and a half, three years old, five years old. And that is that if you work hard enough and you achieve success, then you will be happy. In fact, let's even take out achievers. Think about the hard work component, but a lot of the world <laughs> doesn't buy into that. So you take out the hard work component. You can still have success leads to happiness. And it's just not true. Now, I know maybe this is already triggering a bunch of you achievers. And for you, if you're triggered, oh, that's not true. Of course, it's success leads to happiness, David. Okay, let's put this out there as a working hypothesis. And I will be exploring this over the course of episodes further down the road. So you can table this and just consider this as a working hypothesis. Okay, I'm not asking you to buy into it yet. But for some of you who have done enough research around happiness, this will be a no brainer. However, you might notice that there are parts of you that don't believe that there are parts of you that actually believe that success will lead to happiness. And if you can just get success, then the love, the joy, the feeling of significance will come naturally as a result of that success. And this is an ingrained part of toxic masculinity. So you might not believe it. You might have heard of toxic masculinity, mostly talked about in terms of sexual harassment or something. But that's just the manifestation way down the line. That's like one of the high branches of it. I'm talking about the we're getting to the root of it. Okay, so this belief of that if I can just achieve more and get the success, whether it's money, power, whatever it is, then then I'll get the women and then I will be happy and then I'll feel like I'm enough and then I'll get love. Okay, so that's the faulty logic that's happening. And that's part of the toxicity of that type of masculinity. There's also the kind of straight run of the mill machoism, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, which basically says it's not acceptable for a man to feel emotions that are vulnerable. I mean, there's a very small range of acceptable emotions for toxic masculinity. They would be something like anger, happiness, feeling powerful, confident, you know, these sort of power emotions. But then the, the real power emotions of vulnerability, of sadness, and sometimes even of anger. There are some types of toxic masculinity where even feeling anger is unacceptable but especially very commonly sadness, anything that would make you cry, those are considered to be negative and weak. And because of that, men who are raised in or bought into a toxic masculinity culture or society are unable to grow and mature. And they end up getting stuck there. And this is sort of like the glass ceiling of toxic masculinity they end up with very emotionally stunted lives. And then they wonder why they don't understand or are able to get or control their own emotions, let alone happiness and love. And the big picture here is, I'm going to get to this in point three, values, your moral values, your ethical principles, your ideals, your moral ideals, these will guide you to the happiness and love that you're really looking for, the emotions. And that's one way that's acceptable for toxic masculinity to get there. So I'm going to be pursuing that angle. And that is no matter which, whether it's from the perspective of toxic masculinity or not, you're going to have to think about your moral values and, and get clear on those and get the clarity on that. But I'm choosing this because it's an especially powerful avenue or approach for those who are living with toxic masculinity, because it is manly to do ethics. <laughs> Right, to, to philosophize about morality. Just the philosophizing itself is just the opening of the door. You're going to need to do the emotional processing around it and then the training and cultivation of it. But just getting your foot in the door with just thinking about these moral issues or just moral principles or just morality in general is a good start. That's just a foot in the door. Okay, so but back to point one about toxic masculinity being a limiting factor. That's preventing men from understanding why their dating and relationships are stagnant or that they're not able to get control or not able to experience love, acceptance, appreciation, connection, and worthiness. And that security that comes from an unconditional love relationship or that intimacy that they crave. Okay, so toxic masculinity prevents men from understanding their own emotional needs. And it prevents them therefore, because if you don't understand your emotional needs, you're not going to be able to learn how to meet them yourself. So it's naturally going to lead to neediness, right? A lot of the energy around success or of trying to succeed in order to be happy 
is a kind of desperation. And you may not feel it for the first decade, but after a while, that burnt out energy of I'm just, those parts are so tired because they've been working so hard to try to get emotional goods of happiness and love and so on through just hard work because they think it's if they succeed then they'll get that those emotions that they're craving and then when they don't get them they just instead work harder and they just entrench back into the same faulty strategy of trying to to get happiness that way through success and it doesn't work and they get more and more frustrated and they have this blindness of their own needs and if they don't understand their own needs they're not going to definitely not going to be able to learn how to meet them in themselves and then, of course, the ultimate need of unconditional love is so far removed from the man who's living under toxic masculinity, because in order to get to love, you're going to have to get to your vulnerability. You're not going to be able to find courage in love or intimacy without coming to those vulnerable parts of you, because those are the parts that are afraid of being hurt or rejected. And that requires to be able to access that courage of your higher self that requires confronting your vulnerability head on. And toxic masculinity represses that. It's a limiting factor. It's like this, uh, it's not even a glass ceiling or glass wall. It's more like a cement thing because it's not transparent. It's opaque. <laughs> you can't even see what's underneath or what's on the other side. So toxic masculinity is a limiting factor. It is a big obstacle. It's a stumbling block. It's getting in the way. That's the first point. The second point is you can see this toxic, whether you're operating under toxic masculinity, by looking at your role models. And this is something I, I kind of traced it backwards, trace the breadcrumbs backwards. It's like these, the tippy tip of some of the higher branches, tracing that back to the, so the more of the, the roots, we're getting into the trunk of toxic masculinity. You can see this in the branches of the wrong role models. And if you're wondering, am I laboring under toxic masculinity? You can just check out your role models. Who are you looking to as examples of how you want to live? And a lot of dudes, especially the younger they get, so I'm going to cap it at 21 years old, let's say, but I work with a lot of guys in their 30s. And even there, we're getting guys who are looking up to other men who have money, power, or women, or all of those. It's sort of like the Scarface role models, <laughs> right? Get the money, then you get the power, and then you get the women, right? That kind of thing. So many dudes are still bought into that. And then they're wondering, why am I not happy? Why am I not experiencing love, right? So if your value system is such that you prioritize money, power, and women, or something along those lines, you know, that's what I've been referring to as these superficial goals. It is actually taking you in the opposite direction from the road that will lead you to happiness, fulfillment, acceptance, appreciation, love, and all of the good emotions that you're hoping will come as a result of money, power, women. And so many men are laboring under the scarface ethics <laughs> and they're wondering why they're not experiencing goodness in life and they're everywhere they turn women are evil vampires out to get them and cheat and lie and this is you can see this in the the turn towards this kind of bitterness and anger that has been happening in the world of single men in the past five to ten years it wasn't happening in the heyday of the pickup artists. They were more of a, it was sort of more of a naive optimism uh, around what women can do, uh, the, the emotions they will give to you if you get enough of them or whatever, if you get enough attraction or and then hopefully find the right one. So that you notice that the normal pickup artist story was he dates lots of women and then one of them stumps him. He's not able to his game doesn't work on her or whatever. And that emotional vampire becomes his love interest and they hook up and he thinks he finds happiness. And then, of course, they don't because that's an emotional vampire pairing. And I've done tons of other content on that, how that's doomed. But you notice that there's this kind of naive optimism around it. Like, I'm going to date lots of women and then pick the one that I like the most and then settle down with her. So there's always in the background this assumption that, that this player phase is just a, a stage on the way to eventual happiness in a relationship when I find the right woman. Nowadays, it seems like the dominant narrative in the Western world for men in their 20s and 30s is different. And heck, maybe 40s, like single men or divorced, divorced men, is that there are no women that you can trust. <laughs> that the nature of woman is whatever, some evil thing, right? And they haven't really thought, though, about, thought through a real moral view, like a view of morality. What's your theory? What's your theory on what goodness is? What constitutes goodness? What are considered virtues? 
so many, so I, I early on, you know, I, I, I used to be a professor of moral philosophy and moral psychology was my main field. And I just, after a while, when you're specializing in something long enough, you forget that everyone else doesn't know what you know, <laughs> kind of take it for granted. So when I was coaching, especially when the internet blew up and I had to respond to comments. So you notice responding to comments is nothing compared to in-person coaching or even an in-person event where you can see the person in front of you, you can get the background of why this is so important for them and so on. Instead, you're answering, you know, somebody's two sentences and he's asking for basically this question, a full answer would require a book, right? So, but I get frustrated, parts of me get frustrated with the comments because we can't give a full answer. But anyway, I'm in the comments and I'm just wondering, what, what? You haven't thought about, you're telling the world that this woman is basically the opposite of virtue, right? She's an evil slut and she has all these vices, like moral vices. Um, she has bad moral character. But then you haven't thought about what virtue means or what would be considered virtuous. And you don't have a robust theory about virtue, yet you're condemning others. And I noticed that this is a very common thing. So that we buy into whatever moral systems were passed down to us uncritically, unthinkingly, unreflectively. And then we wonder why we're not in control of our own happiness. And I'll tell you, this is the whole point of this episode is it's because you haven't thought through your own moral values in any deep sense. And a lot of dudes have just bought into the money power women thing, which I can understand coming out of puberty, <laughs> right? You're just still driven by sexual gratification. And you think that's all you want. In some cases, that is. You're just horny. You want to get off. Okay, so that might be for a 13-year-old or something. But you're now 35. Okay, so there's something deeper here. And what you're really looking for, again, the working hypothesis that you might even give assent to right away, just reflecting on your own life, is that what you really want is love and connection, not just sex. We're not just money and not just power. And maybe not even, a lot of guys don't even think about power which is great, <laughs> right? So I'm not saying you should. So just in case this is not clear, in case anyone gets triggered by any phrase I use, gets taken out of context, uh, making it clear, money power women is not my value system and I'm not proposed, I'm not supporting it. <laughs> this is an example of what not to have. And if you have that, that's not gonna lead you to happiness and love, it's the opposite. Do you struggle in your interactions with women or in your intimate relationship? Are fear, shame, or neediness sabotaging your relationships or attractiveness? In my Platinum Partnership Program, you'll discover how to transform your psychological issues, improve your success with women, and uncover your true self. Get access to all my current and future online courses by applying for the Platinum Partnership today at davidetienphd.com backslash platinum. And notice that you'll, you can see whether, what, you know, what your moral values are by looking at the role models you've chosen, maybe unconsciously for yourself. Who do you look up to and go to for advice? Now, look, if I have uh, a money issue, I will go to a guy who's made a lot of money and I won't look at, I and mean, it's not that important to me how his personal life is and all that. Just like if I hire a plumber to fix my plumbing, I'm not going to quiz him or grill him on his marriage, right? Because he's here to do a job. So I'm not talking about role models in that sense. I'm talking about the fact that many of guys look to certain role models as models for how they should live life, not just in specific areas especially in the areas of personal relationships, a lot of guys are looking at, okay, this guy has money or power, then I will follow his dictums and his examples and his moral values, his principles, when it comes to happiness and love in his personal life. And that's generally a disaster. And then you look at who you're looking up to in terms of role models for when it comes to success with women. And it's a lot, you see, notice a lot of guys will have this conflicting parts that they'll have a part that really looks up to Hugh Hefner types, like a Dan Bilzerian type of guy. And they're complicated people, as all people are. Right? But they're looking at that like, oh, this guy's got tons of women, and I'm going to replicate that. And then they're wondering why they're not finding happiness and love. Because there's another part of them that wants happiness and love and intimacy and acceptance and connection. And the way that some of these role models are pursuing it won't lead to that. 
And they're not. These guys don't know why. Why would they haven't thought, stop to think about that, that your moral system will lead you like kind of dictate how your life will go emotionally. OK, so look at your role models. That's the second point. And then the, as a sub point, why do you even need role models? Like I get that it's natural for people to look to a role model or a mentor or a teacher or coach or uh, an older brother or somebody like that as an example of how they can live their lives better. And that's great. You might even have taken me as a role model. And if so, I'm very flattered. <laughs> but look, in order for you to decide whether the advice or example of that person is worth following, you would have had to judge for yourself. And then, then at some point, role models turn into gurus where their advice or their example is taken uncritically. That happened for us, for most men under toxic masculinity and just in pop culture. It happened early on in our lives when we take the examples uncritically because we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust our own judgment. And then we start buying into their unspoken, implicit value system. And then because it's unspoken, implicit, unconscious, we don't get an, an opportunity to query it, to question it, to criticize or evaluate it. And that's part of the reason why so many people around the world are having difficulty finding happiness and intimacy and love. It's because their moral systems or their values are preventing that. So the sub point being, maybe you don't need any role models. Because in order to decide whether to follow this person's advice, you would have to evaluate it yourself, which means you already have your own inner role model, some part of you, or maybe it's a, something in you that is not a part that has the answers to all of these interpersonal questions all of these emotional issues already is a part of you that where there's something inside you that already knows what to do. And that something inside you, I've been referring to as your higher self, or at least in the last episode I did. So just think about that possibility. Maybe you don't need any role models. I don't mean by that, <laughs> that you don't need any advice or help or, you know, obviously, uh, it's just where we go from role model to guru, where we start to take uncritically advice where we don't evaluate the advice, but trust the advice because it comes from that person. And then we kind of check our brains at the door. Don't let that happen for you. And then just wonder, why do I even need role models? I can get people who are experts in certain areas and you know get their advice in the domain in which they are an expert or specialist. But I don't need an all-encompassing role model where I'm saying, I will be exactly like this person. And just as another aside, a very common client profile for me, and because I see it among guys who have trouble with dating and relationships, is that the neediness in them, this kind of codependent fixer parts of them, naturally enter into guru type of idealization relationships with other men and with the women that they get attached to, where it's this idealization where that person, the role model guru cannot do any wrong, the, the woman, the love interest, the crush, whatever, she's this perfect human being, that guy is this perfect. And then as soon as there's a chink in the arm, or, or that person maybe makes them feel less than, then boom, that person is the devil is the and mortal enemy is, you know, so then we have this phase of idealization devaluation in very extreme ways, where this person has all the answers, this person then has none of the answers and, and needs to be completely destroyed out of my life. And notice that if you have trouble living in the gray, where like, take me as an example, you might disagree with 5% of what I say, or maybe it's 20% of what I say, that's fine. <laughs> There's no one in this world that I agree with 100% on, like that I know well. <laughs> okay, and that's fine. It's part of being a philosopher <laughs> is that you are a professional disagreeer. <laughs> you know, that's part of your job. You look for things to disagree with. And if you can't find anything, then just look for counter arguments against your own arguments. And that's totally fine. This is part of life. And you have the option of changing your mind in the next second. If you find a better argument that you hadn't considered, or maybe you see the thing you had uh, rejected before, and now you see the mirror to it and live in the gray because that's life. Life is all in the gray. The extremes actually aren't instantiated. They don't exist in real life. But people who cling on to gurus and role models live in the extremes. And that's part of the neurotic nature of those parts. And this is a sign that you should take that therapeutic process really seriously. And ideally, 
also along the way, get a good therapist and commit to that course of therapy for, you know, on a weekly basis for a while. Okay, so that's the second point, wrong role models. You can check to see your role models to see what your value systems might be. Because I know for a lot of people, and I've done this teaching, and I've, you know, I've gone into this issue of, or this topic of moral values uh, in the area of dating and relationships, which is really sort of surprising for a lot of people. Like, oh, I didn't think I'd be thinking about goodness and good and evil and that sort of thing. And I know that most people have not thought about that. And so they have no idea what their moral values are because they haven't stopped to seriously ask themselves about it. And if that's you and you want to get a head start or a, a quick hack into what are your moral values, look at your role models. And then for a lot of guys, it's that scar-faced trio of money, power, women. And maybe it's different for you, which is great. And what are they? What are the moral values that your role models have? Very likely, you've imbibed the same values. And that's part of why you're attracted to them unconsciously in the first place. And then the third point is about uh, the fact that we are not evolved for happiness and love. These moral values are, there's an evolutionary edge to them. There's an evolutionary advantage to them, which I'll get to in another episode. But here, just pointing out, we are evolved for survival and reproduction, not for happiness. And love and these good emotions have adaptive value. They help us to thrive as a species, but they are not necessary for survival and replication. You could survive just by implementing a fight, flight, freeze type of life, and then you could reproduce by raping or something like that. If you think back to caveman days, you don't need to have love in that situation to just survive and reproduce. And so many men recently, in the recent five years or so, with this manosphere, the men's rights movements that are so focused on, you know, red pill, MGTOW, that have this kind of anger and bitterness about them and resentment, that they're driven by this view of life that brings its own set of moral values that they're not even aware they've imbibed or that have infiltrated their lives. And they're wondering why, because of their moral views, it makes it impossible for there to be the kind of vulnerability required for love. And then they wonder why they don't have any happiness and love in their lives. And that's a life of red in tooth and claw. You know, life is brutish and short and just get yours. Just go out and get whatever you can because no one's actually going to love you the way you want. And, there, and in fact, love does not exist. You know, the whole thing, the whole macho, toxic masculinity, all of that lends itself very well to the, this moral view of, uh, that comes out of this particular view of evolution of simply survival and replication. And because this is the way the world is, then that's the way things ought to be. And that's the sub point here that it's one thing to say this is a particular view of evolution. And even if you grant that, and I don't think that's the whole story, obviously, but we can grant that because there is, like I said, evolutionary adaptive value to love and all those feel good feelings. But let's just take that. Okay, survival and replication. That's the main thing. Okay. But that's just how things are. That's the is. That doesn't mean that that's how things should be. And in philosophy, this is considered the is odd fallacy. That just because things are a certain way does not mean that they ought to be that way. But so many men in their bitterness and resentment make that mistake, that logical fallacy to commit that of going from what is leads to that's going to be the shoulds and my oughts in life. And they draw their moral values from the fact that they believe from their belief that uh, life is about surviving and reproducing, which leaves no room for moral goodness. In fact, they believe that moral goodness in the background, you know, they may not assent to this explicitly, but there's this background belief in that kind of toxic masculinity that moral goodness and compassion and even the, perhaps sadness is a weakness. And that's part of why they are not able to experience those emotions that they really want of love and connection. And that's fueling their bitterness and resentment. And you might have seen this among some of your acquaintances or maybe in yourself. So there is room for moral goodness. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to that. What is the place of goodness then? Is there such a thing as good? Is there such a thing as love? And I will preview some of what I'll be covering in the next episodes, which is that the evolutionary adaptive advantage of moral goodness 
is that if you believe this, you will draw into your life others who believe it. <laughs> okay, and a big part of it is trust. Without moral goodness, it is very difficult to relax and trust. So you can trust as long as you're, you got one eye looking behind your back, right? And you got to you know, always check your back. However, if you believe in moral goodness, for instance, this is just an example. And I'm, I'm going to develop this in following episodes. Then one of the things that comes out of that is the ability to relax and trust. And society, our societies, our advanced civilizations are built on this trust. And it might be that we have checks and balances, but every day that you drive down a road that doesn't have a physical barrier, that's just two painted lines, you are actually trusting that the other person is not a psychopath or suicidal <laughs> and is going to take you out because all they got to do is whoop, and you're done. You already are living a life with trust. Now, how that comes about, do you have a well-worked out theory? Maybe you're a contractarian. Or do we have diff there are different theories to account for that. And there is, I think, a superior theory that I'll be getting to that will lead you more likely to find love and happiness and intimacy in your life. That's for later. But I just want to point out as an example, trust. Because without trust, you're not going to be able to tap into that or access the courage that is required for unconditional love. A reason why most men are unable to love unconditionally or even discover unconditional love, whether it's coming out of them or coming to them, is because they're afraid. They don't trust others. They don't trust, especially the more that they are vulnerable, the more attached, the more they get the feels, the more entangled they are, the more that they are afraid the more neediness arises, the more uncertainty comes up, the more fear is generated. And then there's no courage. Courage decreases over uh, the, the greater the attachment. So they want to guarantee that she will not leave him or cheat on him or whatever. And if they can't, then they won't allow themselves to love, to open up and to have that love. And that's because they can't trust her. They can't trust that she won't stab him in the back. And more at a deeper level, <laughs> They can't trust that they'll be okay if she d does that. That they won't recover from the hurt or that they won't come out better from the hurt. And that's because they don't have trust in their own higher self or their own true self. Your true self, our higher selves, have all the courage that we need to experience and give unconditional love naturally and effortlessly. Because our higher self, your true self, has all you need to meet all of the needs of all of your parts that are in fear. But instead of having that happen, instead of your higher self meeting the needs of your fearful parts, instead you're being led by the fearful parts, or you as in these men un laboring under toxic masculinity who are too afraid to open up and are afraid of being vulnerable and see that as a weakness and so on. And what they really need is their own true self to be able to come to the fore to meet the needs of their parts that are fearful and to trust in your own true self and your own higher self because your own true self and higher self has the courage required for unconditional love. And then it all happens naturally. Then you're not looking for with fear to her to say, don't leave me or I'm going to fall apart in pieces and I don't know what I'll do with my life. Or don't cheat on me or don't betray me or whatever, or I'm going to, I won't be able to handle it. And that's the fear that's driving so many men and part of it is because their own moral system would not give her a reason not to do that. Like their own moral system, they complain about what they call hypergamy, hypergamy, which is hypergamous behavior among women, which is just getting the guy with more status or the, just the better catch. In their moral system, there's no reason why she wouldn't trade up because in fact, he would do the same freaking thing. And that's why he's so scared. Right? And so he's always on his toes and can never relax because he's always got to be better than the bigger, better deal that she could get. And then, there, in fact, there's no love there. That's just a transactional relationship that's held together by fear and neediness. Right? And that drives out love. Okay, so the recap of these three points, I'm going to be expanding in the next episode, of course, because there's so much, to, I, could, I could do a whole semester or year-long course on this easily. The first point is the reason why it's so hard for men, especially, to experience happiness and love and intimacy is because of toxic masculinity in their culture or society or their environment growing up. 
and, and maybe not even growing up, but just now, a toxic masculinity. The second is, if you want to know what your values are, you can look at your role models. And the third is, we are evolved for survival and reproduction, and not for happiness and love. But that doesn't mean that we need to give in to the is ought fallacy or follow the or commit the is ought fallacy. And in fact, we need to pay attention to the importance of moral goodness. I'm going to develop that final point about moral goodness in the next episodes. That's a recap of those three points. This is super, super important. If you do not think clearly about your values, and especially if you're not currently experiencing unconditional love, I can imagine theoretically somebody sort of just stumbling into an unconditional love relationship, maybe with a super mature partner who's sort of leading them through it. I can imagine that theoretically, hypothetically. I think that's a really rare case. But for everyone, so for everyone else, if you don't think clearly about your own values, you will never be able to be the leader in the relationship, that's for sure. But you will also never be in control of or even understand why it's so hard for you to find happiness and love and have the courage for unconditional love and intimacy. Okay, so this is super important, what we just covered. And I've experienced all of this myself. That's why I can speak with this with total uh, intimacy. But also, I've seen this happen in hundreds of clients and thousands online. This very same thing of laboring under toxic masculinity, the macho repression, the false limiting belief of success leading to happiness, uh, the denial of their own needs and their blindness of what their driving needs of love and connection are, or even how to meet them and how to uh, meet your own needs for love, or even what love means or what good means. And I can see this in their messed up role models that they follow in all the areas of life in which that role model is not <laughs> an expert or a specialist or buying into his value system. And then of course, I've dialogued with as many of these people as I can and discovered that they're a big part of the value system is committing the is ought fallacy and coming out of this sort of bare bones survival and replication view of evolution, of survival of the fittest, of uh, red and tooth and claw. And I've experienced all of those stages myself. I've been in the red pill in that despair and that angerness and bitterness for you know half a year, and I'm very angry towards women, women kind, feminism, the whole thing. And I think I have a more balanced view of it now. But I, that, I'm very grateful that I had that period because I can understand those who are still in it. And that's a big part of that's coming from living under toxic masculinity, having a particular value system uncritically. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few episodes to dig deep into that. Because if you don't figure that out, you get lost in that other red and tooth and claw value system of just survival or replication, you get yours, can't trust anyone fully, you can't be open and vulnerable because they're just going to stab you in the back. Don't make yourself vulnerable. The whole Machiavellian approach to life of art of war and Sun Tzu, you know, all that. Though I think if you look at Sun Tzu in the right way, then you, but anyway, there's just the more caricatured version of, you know, the prince of the Machiavellian, of Hobbes Leviathan, all of that. That is a recipe for unhappiness, for despair, for bitterness, and hey, this might keep you alive and you might end up reproducing with other emotional vampires, but it won't lead you to happiness, that's for sure. And it won't lead you to peace of mind or calm or love, especially. So if those are the things you're looking for, come back to the next episode. We're going to get be going even deeper into the specific values, which specific values are best for happiness and success in love, in dating and relationships, which specific values are best for success with women with love with relationships. That's the next episode. Come back for that one. Thanks so much for listening. If you like this, share it with your friends. It means a lot to me if you do that. And I hope to hear from you soon and love to hear from you what you thought about this. And I also want to throw out there to invest in yourself so that you can actually experience how natural and effortless it can be to love unconditionally, that when you are able to access that courage in you, that you're not afraid of being hurt in an irreparable way, that you can meet your own needs for love and connection and security and significance and so forth, that unconditional love just flowing from you, it is just, uh, that's the meaning of life. And invest in yourself to create this for yourself. It is not a natural thing. We started with that myth that happiness is just natural. We are not evolved for that. So you've got to create it. 
invest in yourself to do that. Okay, so share this uh, link if you liked it, and I will see you in the next episode. David Tien, signing out. <laughs>